الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد آخر الأنبياء في الدنيا عصرا وأجلهم يوم القيامة شأنا وذكرا صلى الله وملائكته والصالحون من خلقه كما وحد الله وعرف به ودعا إليه أما بعد Before I start the story of Nabi Allah Ayyub I want to inshallah ta'ala give a muqaddimah and that muqaddimah is an introduction my beloved brothers and sisters I want each and every one of us to understand this point and what I found and what I have seen in the times that I have spent in giving da'wah advising people and I am not ahlul lidhalik, I am not befitting for that. But the times that I've given advice and I've listened to people's problems, one of the reasons in which I have found that people's depression and anxieties and sadness comes from is not understanding the world that they're in. I want us to understand this point. This is very important before we go into the lecture. This world that we're living in is Darum Tihanin Wabtila. This world, when Allah made it, Allah made it to test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created this world to put us through trials and tribulations. If you don't recognize that, and if you don't come to terms with that, the perception that you have in your mind, whether you've taken it from Hollywood or Bollywood, and that has given you the perception, the truth of the matter is, Wallahi, if things don't go according to what you thought, you become depressed and you become sad. But if you knew that this world is darum tihanin wa ibtila, then you expected it. وَلِذَلِكَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى He says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَقُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ Do the people think? Do they assume? Does this come to their mind? That when they say, I believe, that Allah will just leave you for your claim? That your statement, I am a believer, and that's it. No. That statement of yours needs to be tested. Are you really a believer? Are you really a mu'min? How is it going to be tested? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bisarra'i wa darra. Allah will bless you, and that's a form of a test. Or He will put you through trials and tribulations and calamities, and that itself is a test. And both of those situations, the human is in it in the course of this time in the world that he's living. However long you live for, you're going to go through those two stages. A time when you're enjoying yourself, Allah is testing you. Allah is testing you. Don't think that the wealth that you have and the children that you have and the money that you have is not a test. It's an imtihan. And Allah is also going to test you by taking all of that away from you and see how you're going to respond. And my beloved brothers and sisters, the person who's going to win, and the person who's going to make it through the trials and tribulation, is the individual who knows how to deal with those two situations. He knows the time that he's put through ease, what to do. What does he do at the time when he's put through ease? He comes with shukur. He knows how to deal now with this good that he has, the wealth, the money, the health, how does he respond? He comes with a shukr, gratitude. And the times that he's put through hardship, he's also prepared and ready to come with a sabr. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, and Imam Muslim narrated in his sahih, min hadith Abi Yahya, Suhaybin radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Messenger said, 
عجبا لامر المؤمن ان امره كله خير fascination and wonder is in the affairs of the believer and this is for no one else except the believer in asabat sarra if he goes through times of good if he's blessed with money if he's blessed with children if he's going through good moments in his life shakara fakana khayra lahu he comes with gratitude how does a person come with gratitude number one number one they speak about this blessing the person says allah has blessed me allah has given me this you don't see them complaining you don't see them complaining they mention the good allah has given them because allah said in the quran talk about the blessings allah has given you the second is the person comes with it in their heart in their heart they know that they have a blessing they have wealth they have children they have health they know they have the blessing and number three is you use your limbs and your body parts with what that which is pleasing to allah how are you going to show gratitude if you're using the hands that he gave you the eyes that he gave you the ears that he gave you the mind that he gave you the time that he gave you and the health if you're not using it in his obedience you're not showing shukr you're not showing shukr you're not showing gratitude the hadith goes on and the messenger sallallahu alaihi he said wa in asabatu dharra and if they are put through hardship calamities allah strips them from their health that they have allah takes their children allah takes their wealth everything from them do you know what they say they show patience because they know the child originally came from Allah and Allah only took what was his. The wealth came from Allah and Allah took what was his. The health that they have, they know it came from Allah in the first place and Allah took what he owned. So what do they show? Sabr, patience. How do they show patience? Three things as well. As-sabr ala ta'atillah, patience upon the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. Patience upon what? The obedience of Allah. Praying the salawat in the jama'ah for the men, it needs patience. Waking up fajr from the sleep and your bed and going to the masjid and doing wudu, it needs patience. Obeying your parents, even though they've reached an old age and it's hard, you're showing that. Sabr. Ala ta'atillah. Number two is as-sabr anil ma'asi. Patience from the sins. Staying away from following your whims and desires. And the third one is الصبر على أقدار الله المؤلمة Showing patience upon the calamities that come your way. The hardship that you're put through. I have spent time reading the Quran. And I have realized that the test, which is the last form of patience, which is الصبر على أقدار الله المؤلمة Being patient upon the calamities that Allah puts us through. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to put us through calamities. Whether it's little or whether it's a lot. But I try to read the Quran and see the stories of the prophets. And I have to say to all of you brothers and sisters, reading the story of these great men, these prophets, wallahi will help you. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِمْ عِبْرَةً لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون. الله سيد لقد كان في قصصهم. The story of these prophets there are lessons in it. فهو لكن لأولي الألباب the smart one. The smart one is the one who's going to open the Quran when he goes through hardship and he will say I want to read the story of the companions and uh, sorry the story of the prophets and the messengers and I want to see what they went through. Our messenger, when he went through hardship, Allah will tell him a story of a prophet. And he will say, this, you're going through Muhammad, don't think you're alone in this. Your brothers who came before you, Ibrahim, and Hud, and Ismail, and Ishaq, and Yaqub, they went on this. This is what they went through. Allah said to the messenger, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min rusul Muhammad, be patient. In what way? The way that the five chosen prophets were patient. Ponder here and analyze this ayah. Five chosen prophets. And they're being tested. 
They are noble prophets. These are the best of the prophets. These are Nabiullah Muhammad, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. They are Ulul Azmi, the five chosen prophets. And they are being tested. So we shouldn't be in any way, shape, or form upset when we're tested. Who are we? Nabiullah Nuh has been tested. Brothers, 950 years Nuh is calling his people. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا 950 years he's calling his people and what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? No one listened to him except a people who can go on a boat or an ark. 950 years. Our life is that, it's not like, it's not that long. The messenger said to us, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِي مَا بَيْنَ السِّتِينَ وَسَبْعِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مَنْ يَجُوزُ ذَلِكَ this life that we're living today is 60, and the messenger said, the highest a person may go is 70, and little go over 70. Nuh, 950 years, he's calling his people, and what were they doing? They were rejecting his messenger, his message. Our messenger, they verbally harmed him, and they called him names, and they criticized him, and they even slandered his wife, and accused her of zina. There was not a time harder for Nabiullah Muhammad in the city of Medina than the calamity he went through by being told that his wife committed zina. He's a prophet from Allah. How hard was it for Aisha and how hard was it for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He didn't know what to do. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, no day came by in my life greater to be than that, that incident. And he showed patience. Allah said to him in the Quran, Muhammad, we know what they are saying to you is hurting you. It's made your heart tight. Look what Allah said to him to do. Wallahi, ponder here, brothers and sisters. Ponder here. Your heart has become tight because of what they said to you and what they're doing to you. But what was he told to do? Scream, shout. لا. He was told to do. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Allahu Akbar. We know you're going through calamities. We know you're going through hardship. But do this, Muhammad. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ Exalt your Lord. وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ And be from those who prostrate. Those who worship Allah. وَعْبُدْ And worship your Lord حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Until death comes to you. Don't leave that path. Be consistent upon the path of worship. So what we realize from this is sabr is something that those prophets went through. Today my focus inshallah ta'ala is Nabiullah Ayyub. The story of Nabiullah Ayyub is a magnificent story. Especially if you're going through hardship. There are many lessons to take from it. If Months we spoke about Nabiullah Ayyub, we will never be able to give him justice. Lakin, since we can't do all of it, we will do the best that we can, inshaAllah ta'ala. Nabiullah Ayyub, his story, Allah mentioned it in two places in the Quran. That's it. Two places in the Quran, Allah mentioned the story of Nabiullah Ayyub. And this is what Ibn al Arab al Maliki rahimahullah mentioned. Qurtubi transmitted that in his tafsir. The Ayyub story was only mentioned twice in the Quran, two places. The first one, it's in your notes, is in Surah Al Anbiya. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala he says, Wa Ayyuba idna da rabbahu anni masani ya durru wa anta arhamu rahibin fastajabana lahu fakashafna mabihi min durrin. وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعْهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَذِكْرَى لِلْعَابِدِينَ That's Surah Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Sad, Allah says, وَذْكُرْ عَبَدَنَا أَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ أُرْكُضْ بِرِجِلِكَ هَذَا مُغْتَسَلٌ بَارِدٌ وَشَرَابٌ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعْهُمْ رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَذِكْرَى لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ وَخُذْ بِيَدِكَ ضِغْثًا فَاضْرِبْ بِهِ وَلَا تَحْنَثْ إِنَّا وَجَدَنَاهُ صَابِرًا 
ni'mal abdu innahu awwab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in these two places the story of Nabi Lahi Ayyub let's ponder on the Quran brothers and sisters our cure is in the Quran inna hadha al-Qur'ana yahdi lillati hiya aqwam there's nothing better for us to ponder over the Quran Allah says and look at the notes that you have wa ayyub an nabi Allah ayyub id nada rabbahu when ayyub called on to his lord what did ayyub do he called on to his lord and what did he say rabbi my lord anni masani adhur harm has touched me wa anta arhamur rahimin i want us to ponder here nabi Allah ayyub he called for his lord the word wa ayyub id nada the word nada means what to call munada means shout ayyub shouted to his lord and i want brothers and sisters to think over here the 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 way that the prophets were when they went through hardship when calamities came their way who did they first run to allah when we become sick and when we go through hardship we call the doctor first we look for the paracetamol where's the panadol where's the headache i need after that doesn't work and then we go to the hospital and the doctor tells us this illness it's cancer then we say people make dua for us oh allah cure us the reality of our situation is worrying like in nabi allah ayyub the first thing that he did was he called on to his lord wa ayyub id nada rabbahu ayyub when he called on to his lord and look what he said I want you to think and the manners that this prophet used. He said, Rabbi, my Lord, anni masani adhurru, harm has touched me. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. Ayyub did not ask Allah to cure him. Ayyub did not say, oh Allah, cure me. He just said, oh Allah, I am touched with pain. I am suffering. I'm going through hardship. I've reached a level of pain. وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِينَ Oh Allah, you're very merciful. You're gracious. He didn't say, Oh Allah, cure me. Why did Allah then say, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We answered his dua. The scholars, they took from this. Presenting your situation to Allah itself is a form of dua. To say, Oh Allah, I'm going through a lot of hardship. Oh Allah, I'm suffering. Oh Allah, that itself, the scholars, they took from this that it's a dua itself. Nabi Allah Ayyub, he said, مَسَّنِي الضُّرْ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِينَ What was the harm that touched Nabi Allah Ayyub? Number one, Ayyub, he lost his family. Two, he lost his health. Three, he lost his wealth. Are you with me, brothers? And I want you to think here. This is a Nabiyyu min Anbiya Allah. Ayyub is a prophet from the prophets of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he has been commanded to convey, convey a what? He was commanded to convey a message. Nabiullah Ayyub was a prophet. If a prophet is ill, and the illness of Ayyub reached a point, my beloved brothers and sisters, that the odor, the smell that was coming from Ayyub was very bad. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions that on his body, Nabi Allah Ayyub, there was not even a place that was cured. A place where you can put a needle, Hatta wasn't cured. And he became sick from inside as well. The only thing that was good from his health was his qalb, his heart. That was the only thing Nabi Allah Ayyub didn't lose. But his body, every single part of it, it was damaged. And the people they left his surrounding, everyone ran away from him. Even his children left him. The strongest opinion is that his children did not die. And his wives, he, they, went, they left his surrounding. Because of his smell, because of his weight. How can a prophet like that convey a message? This is the highest level of test. To be alone. And then guess what happened to Ayyub? He was then taken out of the city because of his health. People found him that his illness is contagious. So they took Nabi Allah Ayyub and they took him out. And the only person that the riwayat, that when you bring all of the 
chains of narrations together. The only person who stayed with Nabiullah Ayyub, the only person who stayed with Nabiullah Ayyub was his wife. She remained with him. She stood by him. She even used to leave and she used to work. Some of the narration mentioned that she would sell. She would buy products and she would sell it until she couldn't find anything to sell. So what she did was she sold part of her hair. And when Nabiullah Ayyub saw that, that his family has reached this level of faqr, poverty, Nabiullah Ayyub, he said this dua, Rabbi inni massani yadur wa anta arhamur rahimin. Oh Allah, hardship has touched me and you're the most merciful. Another story mentions that Nabiullah Ayyub Two of his closest friends, who also didn't leave his surroundings, they were with him, they stayed with him. One of them said to the other one, after they assisted Nabiullah Ayyub and they helped him, one of them sat with the other and he said, I know why Allah put Ayyub through what he put him through. 18 years Ayyub was suffering. I know why Allah put Ayyub through this trial and tribulation. And so the other one said to him, why? And he said to him, Ayyub came with great sins. Ayyub came with great sins. And so the one who heard from the other one, he took the story to Ayyub. He said, Ayyub, this is what's been said about you. And Ayyub said, Wallahi, that is not the case. What I'm going through is not because of a sin I did. But he said, rather, I would be walking in the city and I would be walking in the town and I would see two people arguing and one person is swearing by Allah's name and the other one is swearing by Allah's name and I know that one of them is lying because both of them if they're swearing by Allah's name and the other one is saying opposite to the other he goes I would go home and I would pay kafara on behalf of the one who's lying whichever of those it was I haven't done anything except that then Nabiullah Ayyub, when he realized the two closest people, this is what was said between them. Nabiullah Ayyub raised his hand to Allah Azza wa Jalla and he said, Rabbi in, uh, Rabb, uh, anni masani yadurru, harm has touched me, I am suffering. Wa anta arhamur rahimin, and you're the most merciful. I want you to all ponder here. The believers, even when they are suffering, they don't blame Allah Azza wa Jalla. They never blame Allah. Because the other ayah, look what Ayyub said. Allah says, وَذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا أَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِنُصْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ Shaytan is the one who put me through this illness. Here he's saying, Oh Allah, you're merciful. And oh Allah, you're kind. And you're generous. You're not one to do this to his slave. 80 years he's suffering and his qalb is still strong with Allah Azza wa Jal. When we go through something and we suffer in life and we lose something that we, that we, uh, the first person we suspect is Allah. The first thing we will say is, why is Allah putting me through this? Why is Allah testing me? Like in Nabiullah Ayyub, what did he say? وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِينَ Oh Allah, you're the most merciful. And he didn't say, oh Allah, you're merciful. What did he say? وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِينَ You are the most merciful. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla said, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ Ibn Al-Qayyim brought a fa'idah out of this. Rahimahullah, I want to mention this. Ibn Al-Qayyim said that Nabiullah Ayyub in this position when he's calling on to Allah, jama'a, he combined in this haqiqah to tawheed. He came with the reality of what tawheed is, which is idhar al-faqri, showing that he's weak. And that who is strong? Who's dominant? Who's powerful? Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the one who's high and the slave is in need of Allah. The fact that he put himself down, Nabiullah Ayyub. And also, the way that Nabiullah Ayyub found joy in calling onto his Lord. He enjoyed it. Ibn Al-Qayyim said, anyone who does this, Allah will accept their dua. Anyone who does this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept his dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he do? He brought back Nabiullah Ayyub, his family. 
Allah also subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him double of what he had. So his children, Allah multiplied them in number. And Allah multiplied his family in number. And Allah multiplied his wealth in number. But look what Allah did. When Ayyub called on to Allah, and Allah gave Ayyub the response to his dua, Ayyub was told to do something. And this is something that we need to take on board, which is, Ayyub, his wife, what she did was, she used to grab him by the hand. She used to stand him up, and she used to take him to the toilet. And she would wait for him outside. And when he would finish his call of nature, she would stand him up from the call of nature, and she would bring him to where he wanted. So one day he took long. He spent too long in the toilet. This was after he made the dua, and he supplicated to Allah Azza wa Jalla. He took longer than normal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him revelation, Nabiullah Ayyub, and Allah said to him, said to him, Urkub birijili kahada mughtasalun baridun wa sharab. Ayyub has two legs, every human. So he hit one leg on the ground. And what happened? Water came from it. Allah told him to drink it. And then he hit it again. Allah told him to take the second portion of water and Allah told him to shower on it. I want you to all think here, which is Ayyub, in that situation that he's in, he's sick. And he was excessively sick and fragile, that his wife has to help him up. But Allah's sunnah is, people have to come with work and effort. Even if you're weak. The religion teaches us not to rely on others. But to be those who come with the means, and then accept the rest, expect the rest from Allah Azza wa Jal. The same is with our mother Maryam. Maryam, when she was giving birth, at that moment that she's under a tree, she's under a tree, the father, there's no father for this child. The people are already criticizing her. Okay? Number two, there's no one to help her. She's by herself. And she's under a tree on a hot day. Allah says to her, وَهُزِّي إِلَيْكِ بِجِذْءِ النَّخْلَةِ Maryam, shake the tree from the bottom. Even if it's little effort that she puts in, don't worry, Allah will finish the rest for you. But something has to come from your side. This concept that we just expect, one day, boom, everything changes, that's not a reality. You have to come with things. So Nabi Allah Ayyub, he hit his leg on the ground, and Allah wa ta'ala gushed water from it. If you look at the other ayah, Allah mentions that Ayyub said, my illness came from who? وَذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا أَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ Shaytan is the one who put me through this. The scholars, they said, what did Shaytan do to him? And how did Shaytan affect him? They said that Shaytan blew into Nabiullah Ayyub's and that is what caused his skin to crack and wounds to come from it. Like in the view that says, Nabiullah Ayyub was possessed is not true. And it's not correct opinion. Lakin it did psychologically affect Ayyub when everybody left him. Because the hadith in Ibn Abi Hatim's tafsir mentions that Ayyub was a rich man. And he had money. And he had a lot of children. And he had a lot of wives. And he had good health. All of that one time went psychologically a person becomes affected. People who are used to, people being around them all the time, and they're used to having a lot of money, and they're used to people following them, when they become alone, they it psychologically harms them. They have psychological issues. I read an article a while back, that mothers who have many children, when their children go and get married, and they move on in the West, they realize that psychologically, it has an effect on them. Nabiullah Ayyub, psychologically. Not to mention, the people are saying, are you going to call us to Allah and Tawheed? Are you going to call us to Jannah and the hereafter? And this is how you are? And this is how your health is? So this psychologically caused Nabiullah, Nabiullah Ayyub suffering. So he suffered psychologically. He suffered physically. 
he suffered internally. No wealth. His children and everything that he owned went. And this carried on for a period of 80 years for Nabiullah Ayyub. And what was it that he showed? Nabiullah Ayyub showed patience. Sabr. He did not allow to complain to anybody. Walidalika, those 18 years, Nabiullah Ayyub never complained to anyone. Not even to his wife. The first time that he complained was when he said, Inni masani yadurru anta arhamur rahimin. Oh Allah, pain has touched me and you are very merciful. That was the first time that he complained. He never complained before that to anybody. Why? Because his connection with, was strong with who? With Allah Azza wa Jalla. Brothers and sisters, sabr is a matiyatu la yadillu rakibuha. Patience, wallahi, is a, it's a riding beast. That if you go on, you're never going to get lost. You're never going to get lost. Wallahi, however, the scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they say, however the calamity becomes hard, if your problem becomes more, do you know what? You're close to the end. The more it becomes hard, the closer you are to the end. I'll give you some examples. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was prisoned in his house. He was lashed. The leader came down. The leader didn't just command his police officers to lash Imam Ahmed. He didn't even think they were doing a good job. He himself came down and he used to lash Imam Ahmed. And he used to have daily amount of beating that he used to have Imam Ahmed. And he was prisoned in his house. And he went through hardship. But what did he gain after that? He became Imam Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Ibn al Jawzi, he was kicked out of Iraq and he was told to leave Iraq. And guess what he did? He went to the neighboring lands and he learned the ten qiraat. Nabiullah Muhammad was kicked out of Mecca and he went to Medina and established a government that he wouldn't have had if he was in Mecca. Ibn Athir was thrown into a well and inside that well he came and he wrote and he authored the kitab Jami' al Usul which comprises Bukhari, Muslim, Abi Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i, and all of those books. The smart person is the one who flips a harm into a benefit. As they say, وَصْنَعْ مِنَ اللَّيْمُونِ شَرَابًا حُلْوًا Somebody gives you a bitter situation, a hard circumstances, find a benefit and good that you can take out of it. Like if you were given a lemon juice, you add sugar to make it good. Every situation that you're put through which is tough and hard, the smart individual, the clever one, the one who knows what it is, is one who's going to take that situation and he's going to use it in a better situation. And he's not going to look at the negative side that is in it. Patience, it's not waiting for the results. Rather, do you know what patience is? Patience is how you wait for the result. It's not waiting that Allah is going to take me out of the problems. But in the meantime, before you get the results, what are you doing? Are you complaining? Are you screaming? Are you shouting? Are you arguing? Are you questioning the qada and the qadr? If you are, then are you truly patient? The patient person, he waits for the result in a well-disciplined manner. وَلِذَلِكَ The Messenger taught us is Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith of the woman in which he saw crying on a grave. And the Messenger came by her and he said to her, إِصْبِرِي وَاحْتَسِبِي Be patient and hope reward from Allah. And you know what the woman said? She said, دَعْنِي She didn't know it was the Prophet. She said, leave me alone. You have not been afflicted with that which I have been afflicted with. And the Prophet looked at him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't say, do you know who I am? He didn't say that. He just walked away. He knew how to deal with situations. He knew that she was grieving. He just left her. After a while, the people said to her, do you know who you just spoke to? She said, no. Do you know who you just spoke back to? She said, no. That was the message of Allah. She was shocked. She ran to his house, alayhi salatu wasalam, and she said, when I came to his house, فَلَمْ أَجِدْ بَوَّابًا I had no security guard. No one's, 
No one's securing his door. So she said, I went in and I said to him, Messenger of Allah, I didn't know it was you, and now I'm going to be patient. And then the messenger said, As-sabr inda sidmatil ula. Patience is when the calamity first hits you. Not hours later, or months, or weeks. Patience is the beginning when it hits you. What's the first thing that you say when you're told about a news that shocked you? Do you scream or do you say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un? And brothers, the person who when hardship hits him will run to Allah is the person who used to run to Allah at the times of ease. Underline that point and remember it. The time that you're enjoying yourself and you're going through good and bliss and ni'am, you train yourself now. Now that you have health and you've got money and you've got children and everything is around you, nurture yourself to connect yourself to Allah. So when that moment comes, you're prepared. Nabiullah Ayyub's story, some benefits that we can take from it, inshallah ta'ala. Fawaid. And benefits that we can take from it. Number one, I mentioned it in the introduction, which is reading the stories of the prophets. What does it do for us? It allows us to follow these people. 18 years, how can one be patient? Number two, point number two. So number one, reading the stories of the prophets. It's something that's going to help you and it's going to aid you. The poet, he said about the righteous people, he said, وَإِذَا مَرِضْنَا تَدَاوَيْنَا بِذِكْرِكُمُ وَنَتْرُكُ الذِّكْرَ أَحْيَانًا فَلَنْتَكِسُ when we become sick and our hearts become dry and our hearts become dark and our iman is low, what do we do? Tadawaina We bring out and we read their biographies. What do they read? The biography of the prophets and the stories of the prophets and the stories of the righteous people. When we, our hearts become weak, that's what we do. And sometimes we leave off the reading of these scholars and these prophets and these messengers. We go on our hills. We go on our hills, meaning we become destroyed. We start complaining. We don't know how to be patient. So reading the story of the righteous people is what actually keeps you high up. You know why? Because you know you're not alone. And that feeling of being alone is not good. That feeling that you feel I am alone, I am the only one suffering, I am the only one going through this, is a problem. But when you read it and you hear, whoa, 18 years? Oh, mine was only eight days. Are you with me? You realize, okay, I need to be quiet. I need to what? 18 years. Suffering. Nabiullah Yusuf alayhi salam, he went to prison for seven years and then another seven years extra. وَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجْنِ Brothers, I want to ask you a question, sisters. Allah, all he needs to say is kun fayakun. But why is he testing these prophets? Because it comes with their status. It comes with their position. Allah tests a person. As Shaykh Muhammad mentioned before, in عِظَمِ الْجَزَاءِ مَعَ عِظَمِ الْبَلَاءِ إِنَّ عِظَمِ الْبَلَاءِ مَعَ عِظَمِ الْجَزَاءِ that the person's greatness is connected to the tests or the calamities is connected to the person's what? Status and their position. Who are the ones who are tested the most? The Prophet. Because they're the highest. They're not ordinary slaves. And then comes after that the righteous person and the righteous person and the righteous person. Because Allah is testing you is not because you're an evil person. And it's not because you're a criminal. And it's not because you're a sinner. It's because Allah wants to purify you, my beloved brothers and sisters. You walk away from this world, and there's no sin on you. You're being cleansed, clean. So when you come the day of judgment, all it is for you is, enter Jannah because of your good deeds. Salam, peace, peace be upon you. Because you were patient. What a good place to be in Jannah. You're cleansed, you're clean. 
So you can just walk into Jannah with no sins. Like in the person who thinks that he's not going to be tested and he's not going to be through, put through calamities, sometimes it can actually be a, a problem itself. If you're given children and you're given wealth and money and everything, Allah says in the Quran, Allah says we open all doors for them. We gave them money, we gave them children, we gave them wealth, we gave them health, we gave them everything. So they thought they were good. They were sinning, but we were not punishing them. We were just giving them more money. They sin, we give them even a better job. They're sinning, we give them even more children. They're sinning, we give them a longer life. Until they started thinking, you know what, there's nothing wrong with me. When that happened, Allah says, أَخَذْنَاهُمْ bagta." We grabbed him. Bagta means suddenly, the person doesn't expect it. And then when Allah grabs you, is he going to let go of you? سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَأُمْلِي لَهُمْ إِنَّ كَيْدِ مَتِينَ so you have to realize that because you've been tested, that doesn't mean you're a criminal. But it could be, it, it, it's of great benefit for you. But what form of calamity that when you go through, which is not good, it's the one that diverts you from Allah. This is where the scholars, they say, what's the difference between a test and a punishment? What is the difference between a person being punished and a person going through a trial and a tribulation, which is just a test? What is the difference? The scholars like Ibn al-Qayyim and others say the punishment is the one who diverts you from Allah and distances you from Allah and distances you from the Quran and makes you question the Qadr. Who is Allah? Where is He? Why is He doing this to me? Are you with me? The second one is the test. It's the one that when it happens to you, in your heart you become humbled. You become what? Humbled. And it reminds you of your worth and what you really are. Our worth is very, we're really something weak. Our essence is weak. So we realize our essence because money, what does it bring sometimes? Arrogance. It makes us go up. When the calamity comes, what does it remind you? You humble yourself. You go down to your, 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 your place. So reading the story of these people, wallahi, it's beneficial. Number two, right? I mentioned number one. How many points did I mention? اختلف <laughs> العلماء. Yeah. The scholars all differed, yeah. How many points did I mention? One or two? I have sisters said, brothers, how much did I mention? Two. Okay, if I mention two, what's the first one? Huh? Reading the stories of the prophets, that's one. Hey, number two. Yeah? My, first, my number one was very long. I did a long number one, but there wasn't a second one. I'm going to mention the second one now, inshallah. Yeah. I'm going to mention the second one now, inshallah. The second one is... Allah praised Ayyub for one characteristics. After all of the calamities that he put him through, what did he say? Sorry, two characteristics, sorry. The first one was what? وَجَدْنَاهُ صَابِرًا We found him patient. Imagine Allah acknowledging for you that you're patient. That's a state that's high. Allah said, I tested him and I found Nabi Ayyub to be what? Patient. This is something amazing. And Ayyub wasn't only the one who was patient. Who was patient with him as well? His wife. Imra'a Saliha. But the Prophet ﷺ said, dunya mata'. This, joy, this dunya is a, is a small joy. It's not really much, the dunya. But the Prophet said, Wa khayrul mata'i. The best joy in this dunya is what? Al Mar'ati Saliha. Righteous wife. Everything else Allah tested Ayyub with, but not with his wife. Are you with me? She was with him through thick and thin. Pay attention here. The same is with Hajara when it come to, came to Nabi Allah Ibrahim. Hajara when she was in the middle of the desert. And Nabi Allah, you brought, Nabi Allah Ibrahim brought her here. I want sisters and brothers to ponder here. Ibrahim alayhi salam 
he said to Hajara, I'm going to leave you. And then she said to him one question. She said to him, Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to do this to us? To leave us in the middle of the desert? And when Nabiullah Ibrahim said yes, she turned away and she said, Idan la Allah. Allah will not forsake us Idan. She said, you can leave. Pay attention to the quwa of this woman's heart. This is the middle of the desert. There's no one here. It's no one. No food, no nothing. He's leaving her in the middle of the desert. And what is she responding? By saying, Allah is not going to forsake us. Allah is not what? He's not going to forsake us. Nabiullah Ayyub's wife is the same. She's not, he's got no money for, he, for her to be with him. He's got no health for her to be with him. Are you with me? Children, he has none of that. There's no worldly possession for her to be with him. Rather, she's the one taking care of him. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So she was a patient, righteous, upright woman. Scholars like Ibn al-Qayyim and others took from a benefit that he said, Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned this, and Ibn Mulaqin mentioned this, and I have to mention this is vital, that the majority of the people who would stay like that, they said that it's the women, not the men. That the women are the ones who would be patient through history, through a calamity that the husband suffers from. Then the man, when it comes to the woman suffering, that he will turn away and say, I'm leaving. Or I'm going to marry a, I'm going to marry a second wife. Huh? That this, historically, it's proven that a woman having a husband who is ill and sick and going through hardship, that she would stay with him until he goes, gets out of it. The adad of the women is higher than the men. These great scholars said this. And this is, The reality that we're in testifies to that. The next benefit is, Allah referred to Ayyub as what? Ni'mal abdu, slave. Allah called him what? Abd. Slave. I want you to all ponder here, brothers and sisters, because we want to take gems from the Qur'an. Allah chose the word Abd. Why didn't he say Nabi? Why didn't he say Rasul? Why did he choose Abd? Because Nabiullah Ayyub came with a righteous position, a noble position, Daraja, Aliya, high station, which really summarized servitude. There's nothing better than being a slave to Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at Allah did. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the times that he was doing the best action, Allah referred to him as a slave. Subhanallah the asra. Subhanallah the asra. Bi abdihi. Salah al Mi'raj is going up in the sky. Allah is calling him what? Abd. Alhamdulillah the anzala. The Quran is coming down on him. This is a big thing. Allah is referring to him as a slave. When the Prophet stood up to give da'wah, when Nabi Muhammad stood up to call to the da'wah, Allah called him what? When the slave of Allah stood up, he didn't say the Prophet of Allah, and he didn't say the message of Allah. So the greatest moments in the Prophet's life the most noble positions, Allah is calling him what? Abd. This teaches us what? When you're going through calamities, the best thing that you can do is to humble yourself and be a slave. Allahu Akbar. And be a slave to Allah Azza wa Jal. Humble yourself. Humiliate yourself. Put yourself down excessively. And know Allah is ghani wa antumul fuqara ilayh. That your Allah is ghani, rich. He doesn't need you. And you're the one who's in need of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's very important. The next benefit in this is Nabiullah Ayyub, Allah referred to him as what? Ni'ma al-abdu innahu. Ni'ma al-abdu innahu awwab. Allah referred to as Nabiullah Ayyub as awwab. Awwab means what? Raja'ah. One who turns back to Allah. Brothers and sisters, I want you to ponder here. Awab means one who repents to Allah, keeps coming back to Allah. It's two meanings that it has. Number one, 
is one who keeps asking for forgiveness. Ayyub is a prophet. He's sick. He's going through problems. And he's saying what? Astaghfirullah. Allahumma gfilli. Allahumma rhamni. Istighfar. Why? Because trials and tribulations are generally connected to what? Sins. When Allah blesses you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things that strip that blessing from you is what, my beloved brothers and sisters? It's sin. Allah says in the Quran, ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْ عُمِ اللَّهِ فَأَذَاقَهَا اللَّهُ لِبَاسَ الْجُوعِ وَالْخَوْفِ بِمَا كَانُوا بِمَا كَانُوا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah tells the story of a city. يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ There was a city, and this city, the scholars, they said it was Mecca. Mecca. Provision, everything. رِزْقُهَا It was importing, exporting, and money, and merchant, and it was up in the sky. Allah blessed this land. He gave them everything they needed. But what did they do? فَكَفَارَتْ The kufr here, it means to be ungrateful. That's what it means in the ayah. فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْعُمِ اللَّهِ بِأَنْعُمِ is the plural of what? نِعْمَةً They disbelieved in the blessing. Meaning they showed no gratitude to that. What did Allah do? فَأَذَاقَهَ اللَّهُ لِبَاسَ الْجُعْ Allah dressed them clothing. Why did Allah say, I clothe them in poverty? Because the clothes doesn't leave you. Poverty never left them. I made poverty placed in front of their eyes. لباس الجوع والخوف and fear. They can't walk anywhere. Everyone's scared of, of the other person robbing him. These two, remember this. These are from the fundamental blessings of Allah, which is what? Wealth and what? Safety. And the third one is health. Allah mentioned it. What did Allah say to Quraysh? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّهُ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ Food, هيا وَأَمَنَهُمْ أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَأَمَنَهُمْ Worship. What did he command them to do? To worship the Lord of the... Because the Quraysh were the custodians of the Kaaba. Worship the Lord of the Kaaba that you're guarding. Worship the Lord of the... The Kaaba that you're guarding. But what did Allah say I've done for you? What did Allah say I've done for you? I provided you something to eat and I made safety for you. Sahih. I ask you all here, everyone here, does every one of you here have food to eat? Naam. Does every one of you have safety here? The Prophet ﷺ said, Man asbaha minkum aminan fi sirbi, mu'afan fi jasadi, indahu kutu yawmihi, fuka'annama hizat lahum dunya bihada filiha. Any one of you who wakes up in the morning, he has the food for that day. Forget next week or the week after. That day, do you have food to eat? Indahu kutu yawmihi. And that person also has health. They have what? And they are safe. They're not worried about no, no one robbing them. They're not worried about anyone doing anything to them. What did the Prophet say? It's like the whole entire world has been placed under your feet. You've got everything. What are you looking for? Why are you not content? You have everything you're looking for. Well, one of the things that shocked me at this era that we're living in is this characteristic of not being grateful. Do you, do you agree? You go to a shop and they, on the side of the shop they have a complaint section. And people actually stand and they fill up the complaint section. They will actually complain. If you go to the airlines and you look at it, you fill in the form and there's a complaint section. And people will go out of their way to complain. So you, you go to the bank and you see a what? A smiley face, a straight face and a what? And somebody will just walk by and just press a sad face on... And you, he was in front of you, you could see he was dealt in a nice service, it was good, it was ajeeb. The reason is because we've been taught to be what? Ungrateful. And this is one of the things that takes away what? What you already have. Walidharika, memorize this. Every one of you memorize this. Shukur is saydun lil mafqood and qaydun lil mawjood. I'll explain it to you in English. Shukur it ties down what you already have. When you come with shukur, whatever blessings that you already have, it will keep it down. It will hold on to it for you. And it will bring you what you don't have. 
the remaining blessings that are out there that hasn't come your way yet, shukr will bring it for you. Well, the scholars they say, Qaidun lil mawjud wa saidun lil mafqood. Qaidun, Qaid means what? Qaid is the one that you tie the camel with. So it's a rope. So that Qaid that you tie it with, it's Qaid that you tie the blessings that are already there, shukr will tie it down for you. Wa saidun, and it hunts for you. Said, you're not Said, right? It hunts for you. Fishing or whatever. Or hunting an animal. What does it bring for you? The blessings that are out there that hasn't come your way. It will bring it for you. Shukr. That's what Allah said. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ To increase means what you already have remains and extra is coming. True or false? No, that's what it means. So both meanings are in the ayah. So when you're not showing gratitude, you know what's happening to you. You're going to lose what you already have and definitely you're not going to get what you're looking for. So when you're complaining, you're going to lose what you already have and you're going to lose the actual benefits that are out there. وَلِذَلِكَ That's why we're commanded to read in the salah every single rak'ah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Praises to Allah. Gratitude. The person shows gratitude. The other benefit that we take from the story of Nabiullah Ayyub is Ayyub said Anni masani ash-shaytanu bi nusbi No, sorry Nabiullah Ayyub He done what is known as Tawassul al-mashru' Tawassul, right? What did Ayyub do? Tawassul Tawassul means what? Ayyub huh? Intermediary, right? Ayyub went through his situation and asked Allah through his situation. And this is permissible. By saying to Allah, Inni masani adhurru wa anta arhamur rahimin. Oh Allah, my situation is very severe and you're very merciful. This is called tawassul which is permissible. There are some types of tawassul which are permissible. صح? From them it is what Nabi Ayyub did here. Also what is permissible is asking Allah through righteous actions that you come with. Like, ثَلَاثَةُ نَفَرِ مِمَّنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ حَتَّى أَوَاهُمُ الْمَبِيتُ إِلَىٰ غَارٍ فَدَخَلُوهُ فَانْحَدَرَ الصَّخْرَةُ مِنَ الْجَبَلِ فَسَدَّتْ عَلَيْهُمُ الْغَارِ فَقَالُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُجِيكُمْ مِنْ هَذِهِ السَّخْرَةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَدْعُوا اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِصَالِحِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مِنْهُمْ اللَّهُمَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِي أَبَوَانِ شَيْخَانِ كَبِيرَانِ وَكُنْتُ لَا أَغْبِ إِلَىٰ أَخِي الْحَدِيثِ Three people went into the cave and what did the first one say Allahumma innahu kana li abawani shaykhani kabiran. I had two parents who were old in age and he spoke about his parents. And then after that, what did he say? Allahumma in kuntu fa'altu dhalika b'tigha'a wajhik. Fafarrij anna ma nahnu fi. Oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, then take us out of what? The problem that we're in. So he interceded through his what? Let's just take that scenario right now. Think about if any one of us got locked into that cave today. What action do we have to ask Allah sincerely and say, oh Allah, I did this for you, and they know it's a big action. You have to ponder over that. Do you have an action like that, big, to say, oh Allah, I did it for your sake, no one else, ikhlas, sincerity, and take me out of what I'm in. So Nabiullah Ayyub, that's what he did. The other benefit that we take from Nabiullah Ayyub's story is, Allah accepts dua and that Allah is not dumb, deaf or blind and Allah is not absent as some may say Allah is present and Allah knows what every slave is asking him for subhanahu wa ta'ala are you with me brothers and sisters but because dua gets delayed doesn't mean Allah is absent okay it means that Allah knows when the right time is going to be are you with me brothers and sisters and there are factors that delay the dua, true or false? Sometimes it's Allah wanting to delay it, and sometimes it's because what you're coming with has not met the criteria, hasn't met the condition. Just like if you take a seed, and you say, I'm going to plant it into the middle of the desert, and you just water it. Is it going to work? You've got the water, you've got the land, and you've got the seed. But is it working? Because the land is not what? Not the right type of land. Are you with me, brothers? What do I mean by that? Your heart is not the right type. You've got a sick-minded heart. So where the dua is coming from, it's not making sense. Also, maybe because you're eating haram, your income is haram. The Prophet ﷺ told us, 
رجل يطيل السفر أشعة أغبر يمد يديه إلى السماء يا رب يا رب ومطعمه حرام وملبسه حرام وغذية بالحرام فأنا يستجاب لهذا A man who is a traveler He's traveling His food is haram His clothing is haram He's nurtured upon haram He drinks haram His whole income is haram Allah the Prophet said فأنا يستجاب لذلك How is this man going to do going to be accepted? Keeping in mind this man came with many factors for his dua to be accepted. The first one is that he said, Ya Rabb. And Allah told us in Surah Ali Imran, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبٍ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ رَبَّنَا 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 What did Allah say in Surah the last page? فَاسْتَجَبْنَا وَيَأْسَبْتِ دَعَىٰ So Ya Rabb is one of the ways the dua is accepted. The man said it. Second one is he raised his hand. The Prophet ﷺ, what did he tell us in the hadith? إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيِّيٌ كَرِيمٌ إِذَا رَفَعَ إِلَيْهِنْ عَبْدُ الْيَدَاءِ لَمْ يَلُوتُ مَا صِفَرَ Allah is kind, Allah is generous. No slave raises his hands to Allah and Allah turns you back not giving you what you're asking for. He doesn't do that. The man raised his hand. He begged Allah. The third thing is that the man came with, which his dua should have been accepted, was what? He was a traveler. As a traveler, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the dua of Musafir is accepted. Are you with me? The fourth thing that the man came with was ilhah. Ilhah means what? The man was repeating his begging. And ya rab, ya rab, he didn't say once. And repetition and continuous going on the dua is one of the ways that the dua is accepted. But just because he came with one big factor, all of that prevented his dua being accepted. Which was what? Haram. Remember those whose income are haram and the money that comes from haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَيُّ لَحْمٍ نَبَتَ عَلَى الْحَرَامِ فَالنَّارُ بِهِ أَوْلَى Any part of your body that came, the money came from it, haram. The hellfire has right on that body the day of judgment. Haq. Like we'll take that portion of food. Are you with me, brothers? So, and in this world, wallah, you're going to suffer. A lot of people are depressed, who are sad, anxieties, because... Happiness is not, my beloved brothers and sisters, it's not the body. Happiness is the heart. It's the heart of Allah that finds tranquility. Are you with me? The person finds happiness within. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So just because you have the money and the wealth and everything, that's, that won't make you happy. That will not make you happy. So look where you take from. Allah hears the dua of his slaves. the sahabas were raising their voice whilst they were on their riding beast. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ صَمًّا وَلَا غَائِبًا You are not calling onto one who's deaf and you're not calling one who's absent. Allah is more closer to you than the riding beast's neck. He's closer to you. Meaning he knows your situation. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only obeys a people who meet the criteria. Okay, they meet the criteria. Also, the benefit that we take from the hadith is when Allah gives, He gives with greatness, not as the humans are. Nabila Ayyub, what did he want in return? He wanted his health back, right? What else did he want? His children and his family. What did Allah say? وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَهُمْ We gave him extra. We doubled his money for him. We doubled his children for him. Why? Because that patience that he came with, that time that he waited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him double of what he wanted. Allah multiplied it for him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you don't know what's waiting for you. Are you with me brothers and sisters? You do not know what's waiting for you. You do not know what's going to happen for you. Sometimes, some situations, people will come up to you and say to you, how is this situation good for me? Eh, when Nabi Khadr was killing the boy, in that situation, does it look good or bad? But was it good? Sah. So your situation may look bad to you right now. And it may not make sense. But you only have the pixel. And Allah has the whole picture. He knows everything. Allah, look at this, brothers and sisters. Allah knows what's happened in the past. Allah knows what's happening now. Allah knows what's going to happen in the future. And Allah even knows what hasn't happened. If it was to happen, how it would have happened? 
Are you going to question his ability then? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows all of that. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges something for you, believe in him, have good thoughts of him. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hadith al-Qusi, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am what my slave thinks of me. So what do you think of Allah? In this situation that you're in, do you think he's doing good for you? Say yes. Allah, look what, 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 what the woman, the zawja, the righteous wife, Hajara, what did she say to Ibrahim? What did she say? إِذَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضَيِّعُنَا Allah will not forsake us. She thought good of Allah Azza wa Jal. Did she not? At the time that she's going to be left in the middle of that? Middle of the desert. It doesn't look right. But she had thiqa. ذَلِكُمْ ظَنُّكُمُ الَّذِي ظَنَنْتُمْ بِرَبِّكُمْ This is what you thought of your Lord. Are you with me brothers and sisters? The calamity hits you. Have good thoughts of Allah Azza wa Jal and believe in Him. And what? And believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. Also the benefit that we take from the story of uh, um, Nabulah Ayyub is that the blessing that Allah gives us, it's based on mercy. I want you to memorize this. If you go through calamities, what do the scholars say? When you go through mercy, that's when you go through calamities, the scholars they say this is Allah's justice. And when you get blessing, this is Allah's mercy. If you're put through calamities and you're suffering, because what we have to understand, I always say this to many people, who said you deserve this blessing in the first place? Who said it was yours in the first place? If I give you 10 dirhams today, and I ask you to give it back to me, and I definitely will, I say give me back my 10 dirhams, do you, do you have a right to be upset with that? I took what was mine. I gave it to you in the first place. Is it not a blessing that I give it, gave it to you in the first place? Did I have to give it to you? Think of it like that. Every blessing that you have, you had no rights to get it in the first place. And Allah said, so what happened to us is we think this was ours and it was taken from us. Sah? But we just need to change the equation. This was never yours in the first place. It wasn't your rights in the first place. You didn't deserve it in the first place. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, a slave will be taken the day of judgment. And he would say, be said to go to Jannah. And he would say, دَخَلْتُ الْجَنَّةَ بِعَمَلِي I have entered Jannah because of my actions. And then his eye, his eye, will be weighed for him on a scale. And what would happen? His eye would be shown to him the blessings that are in this eye. And all of the righteous deed that he did. And it would not be equivalent to what? Not even his eyesight. So, وَلِذَلِكَ The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْجَنَّةَ بِعَمَلِي قِيلَ وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ وَلَا أَنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِي يَاللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةِ مِنْهُ وَفَضْلًا The Prophet said, no one is going to enter Jannah because of his actions. And they said, even you are Messenger of Allah. What did he say? He said, even me. Because we don't deserve Jannah. It's Allah's mercy that's taken us to Jannah. That's what the Prophet said, إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِي يَاللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةِ مِنْهُ وَفَضْلًا Unless Allah pours His mercy and His kindness on me, there's no other way to enter Jannah. What is, pay attention, what is our actions then? What role does it play? Our action is what opens the discussion in the first place. Do you get it? Our action that we come with opens the discussion in the first place. Are you with me? Whether Allah should shower His mercy on us or not. But our action is not what takes us. So we don't just come and say, okay, open space, I need to go to Jannah. No. It's not like that. Your actions won't do that for you. Your actions would rather just allow for you to be looked for. Also, the other thing that we benefit is um, a point that I want to touch on, which is, and this is a point that I think it shows the virtual istidlal of some groups that deviate from the haqq, which is, Nabiullah Ayyub, when the ayah came down, Urkud birijilika, some group they took this as to mean the permissibility of a raqs, that you can dance, and a form of ibadah. 
There are a group of people who think, huh, twirling and going round. It's a ibadah, they get closer to Allah by it. And what do they use? They use this urkud. Birijilika, hit your leg on the ground. When Ayub said, Allah said, hit your leg on the ground, they said, oh, you see, you can dance to get closer to? To get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is not correct. The Quran should be understood how the pious predecessors understood it and the way that they explained it. I want to mention another benefit. The mentioning of water gushing from the earth has been mentioned twice in the Quran and twice in the Sunnah. The first one was what? Ayub that we just mentioned. The second one is Nabiullah Musa alayhi salam. When Allah told him to hit the rock and then it became 12. The two in the Sunnah are what? The Ma'u Zamzam. And the third one was, and this, uh, the second one, and this is the best of them all, was the water that gushed out from the Prophet's hand. This is the greatest miracle now. The rest they came out of the earth, places where they normally come out from. But this one came out from the middle of blood and pus. And this is the greatest form for people to use water that comes out of your hand uh, like that. Also the benefit that we take from this story is that the evil and the good are both a calamity and a test. Allah wa ta'ala, He says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ That Allah tests you with what? Good, and what does He test us with? What is it that is upon us? What is it that is upon us when we're tested with good? What do we do? How do we pass that test? Show, sh show what? How do we show shukr? Number one, I mentioned three points. What were they? Number one? So using that shukr in the obedience of Allah, that's one. Hey, number two, talking about it, telling the people. But what kind of blessing do you talk, do you talk to the people about? Ibn al-Qayyim says the one that's general. If you have a blessing which is unique for you, and you know the people around you don't have it, don't go around saying, look, my money is, I make 50,000 a month. Yeah? Because that can bring what? Ain. It can bring evil eye. You speak about the general blessings that you have with the people. Are you with me? Number three was what? To believe it in your heart. To actually believe this blessing. That's true. And what was the second time when you're tested with calamities and hardship? What do you need to come with? Sabar, patience. How do you come with patience? So how do you come with the uh, calamity? Asabru ala ta'atillah. Patience is three types, right? To be patient upon the obedience of Allah. Asabru anil ma'asi. To be patient from the sins. And the third one was what? Asabru ala aqdarillah al mu'lima. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he divided the patience and the calamities that the person goes through into two types. And I want you to memorize this. A calamity that comes to you from Allah directly. That's it. Where did it come from? You lost your child from who? Allah. The second one is, you lost your child due to somebody's hand. Somebody ran over your child. This one, he said, is the hardest one. Because the person you can blame is right in front of you. You're looking at them. To hold yourself and to restrain yourself is the hardest form. This that we spoke about, which is patience and... Patience and what? Shukur, gratitude, right? Ibn al-Qayyim wrote a book. He called it the Uddatu Sabirina. The Uddatu Sabirina wa the Khiratu Shakirin. What did he call it? Uddatu Sabirina wa? Wa the Khiratu Shakirin. And what does this book deal with? The person who's trying, if you want to get to Allah, if you're flying to Allah, what do you need? You need two wings. What are the two wings? Patience and? If you come with one, not the other one, what's happening? You're flying with one wing. Can you fly? Will you get to Allah? No, you won't get to Allah. You will not get to Allah. So patience is a great station and a great action um, that this story mentioned uh, we benefited from. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he Nas'alullah tabarak wa ta'ala yaj'alana min as-sabirin May Allah make us from those who are patient and that Allah gives us cure and health and benefits in this world Allah has the ability to do so anything that I might have said that was wrong 
or incorrect shortcomings or fault is for me a shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayhi.